A family's peaceful holiday gathering is suddenly crashed by a murderous maniac with an assault rifle. And a frantic emergency operator hears the unspeakable horror unfolding at Grandma's house. I remember saying to myself, you know, what the hell, how many more could there possibly be? This shocking tragedy would wipe out all but two members of what was regarded as the perfect all-American family by friends and neighbors in Weatherford, Texas, a quiet bedroom community of Fort Worth. They were something else in their little town. Where Craig Kaler, an accomplished engineer, was the town's utility director. It was a not only well-paying job, but a well-respected position within the community. Craig and Karen were also the proud parents of two beautiful teenage daughters, Emily and Lauren, and a toddler named Sean. Emily was the firstborn, and she was a smart kid, a pleaser, wanted to do good, kind of like her mom, creative and smart. So was younger sister Lauren, but in a different way, says their Aunt Lynn, Karen's younger sister. She was kind of silly, more of a creative, outside the box kind of a thinker. The pair had combined their talents to become the leaders of an all-girl band that made them local stars like their mom and dad. Emily played the drum set and sang, and Lauren played the bass and sang. And with their beautiful home and all the other trappings of wealth and success, the Kaler family was living the dream. But Lynn says that although Craig and Karen appeared to be still in love after more than 20 years of marriage, behind closed doors, they had hit some bumps in the road. Relationship-wise, with between the two of them, it was just not going well. Lynn says she had learned that Craig had become obsessively controlling, right down to limiting Karen to an allowance and even setting the precise time they would have sex each night. If she didn't do what he wanted, bedtime at nine, she would, quote, pay for it. But Lynn says Karen continued to cater to Craig's demands to keep peace in the family. She found it just easier to go along with, okay, he expects this, so I might as well just do it, so I don't have to pay for it later. That is, until Karen found someone who treated her a whole lot better. Another woman, Sunny Reese, a beautiful fellow fitness instructor Karen had met and fallen for at the gym where they both worked. My theory is Karen was so beaten down for so long. Finally, somebody took an interest in her in a positive way and treated her well. Karen and Sonny are said to have become so inseparable that Karen told Craig about their affair. And her husband reportedly not only approved of it, but actually encouraged Karen to continue seeing Sonny. I kind of had a thought in mind of the three of them having been involved in a, a threesome type of situation. Until Craig found himself the odd man out. It seems like it kind of backfired on him. As it became obvious that uh, Karen and Sonny were both interested in each other and not in him and kind of started pushing him out of the picture. Then he became extremely jealous of that relationship. So jealous, allegedly, that Craig took a new, even higher paying government job in Columbia, Missouri and moved Karen and their daughters into an even nicer home there just to get his wife away from his love rival, Sonny. He basically thought that moving the family away, getting them to another town, that they'd go back to having the perfect life. But within a year, Karen files for divorce takes her daughters, and returns to girlfriend Sonny. He didn't know how to handle that. And then it happens. As Karen and the kids are visiting her grandmother, 89-year-old Dorothy White at her farm on Thanksgiving weekend. <laughs> the grandmother calls her emergency alert service, saying a gunman has just burst into her home, firing at anything that moves. The alarmed operator can hear gunfire in the background. <laughs> Sheriff's deputy Nathan Perling is the first to arrive at the crime scene to find the grandmother in the kitchen, still alive but bleeding to death from multiple gunshot wounds. 
her forearm, her abdomen, uh, the amount of blood, that there wasn't anything that I could do for her at that moment. Deputy Perling follows a trail of blood and shell casings into the dining room, where he finds Grandma White's granddaughter, Karen, also riddled with bullets and apparently dead. She was on the floor on her back. She didn't look like she was breathing or had a pulse. As he continues through the house, Deputy Perling finds Emily also apparently dead in the living room. She had been shot once in the chest. She either was hiding or fell behind the couch in the coffee table. It's like the deputy has walked into a waking nightmare. I remember saying to myself, you know, what the hell? How many more could there possibly be? And then something eerie gets his attention. I heard this voice, very faint, um, very uh, disturbing, I guess is the word I would use, um, pleading, help me help me, uh, I don't want to die. The deputy follows the voice up the stairs to find Karen's youngest daughter, 16-year-old Lauren, shot in the back and bleeding to death from her bullet wounds. Her lower right side was turning purple as I was watching it, so I could see the blood pooling up internally. But Lauren was still desperately clinging to life and still talking. Her last words recorded by Deputy Perling. Hold up, don't move. I know. Don't move. I don't want to die. I'm going to take care of you, okay? Make me alive. Next, Lauren, in her dying breath, identifies who murdered her family. Who did this to you? And she was very clear. And so at that moment, I put out the, I put out the dispatch who we were looking for, uh, who had done this. And then I just held her 